All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for attending the information session on the spring 22, spring 2022 guidance uh, from the Student Exchange Visitor Program. Uh, my name is Christina Kahn, and I'm the director at UCF Global, and I'm joined here with other members of the UCF Global team who are here. Um, we have Zach Saloom, Sherry Busansky, uh, Rodney Williams, Daniel Mallon, Eleni Lopez, Eleni Lopez, Elise DeWolf Ott, Nicole Stelter um, are all members of the team who are on the call on the Zoom today and who will also be monitoring the chat for questions. So we'd like to welcome you uh, to the information session. This session is being recorded and will be posted on the UCF Global YouTube channel shortly after the event today. Um, please use the chat feature if you have questions throughout the information session. We really want this time to be useful to you and that you, so that you can get answers to your questions. If you have a specific question regarding your, your own particular situation, feel free to reach out to your immigration advisors. We are here to help. So the agenda for today is we're going to start by giving an overview of the guidance for spring 2022. Uh, we're going to talk about the enrollment requirements for the spring semester, also some travel considerations, especially if you're planning international travel uh, during winter break, and we'll also get to questions and answers. So thank you to everyone who pre-submitted questions. We've incorporated those into the presentation already, but if you have questions, again, as we go along, just feel free to put them in the chat. And I will have to give a disclaimer, as we all know, the uh, COVID-19 situation is still very fluid. And so the information that we're presenting today is accurate as of today, but it could change. So um, it's important to note that, you know, we're giving you the most recent information as of today, but feel free to continue to check uh, the UCF Global COVID-19 FAQ page for the latest information. And if any major changes happen, we will always send out an email uh, to students as we have been throughout the pandemic. Uh, before we get into that, I do want to remind students about the HERF grants for COVID-19 assistance. If you have not yet applied uh, for this fall semester, I would encourage you to do so. You can find a link to the HERF application on the UCF Global page. Uh, there is on the main page, there is a little uh, box that says emergency assistance, COVID-19. Please check, uh, click that box and it will take you right to the application for the HERF Fund. So uh, these are uh, grants of up to $2,000 uh, for anyone who's been impacted by COVID-19. So international students, DACA students, undocumented students are all, are all eligible to apply. So if you haven't yet applied for fall, please do so. Uh, we wanna make sure that you get the assistance if you're eligible for it. And um, if you've already received it this fall, uh, you get it once in the semester. We don't yet know about spring uh, HERF funding opportunities, but once we do, we'll certainly send out a message to the community. So as we get started, it's important that we go over some key terms that you're going to hear a lot so that we're all on the same page. So first, you'll hear the term SEVP. This means the Student and Exchange Visitor Program. This is part of Immigration and Customs Enforcement, which is part of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, this is the government organization that's responsible for F visa students. So if you have an F visa, um, the student exchange visitor program policies it, apply to you. We, you also hear the term CVIS a lot. That is the student and exchange visitor information system. This is a government database that's used to report information about your program. Uh, it's used by your UCF Global advisors. Um, to issue your I-20, to, to report that information. So uh, you'll hear the, the word CBIS a lot. And then I-20, uh, most of you have an I-20 on this call. So this is your official document issued by CBIS um, and it indicates your eligibility for an F-1 visa. So very important document. All right, so guidance for spring 2022. The great news is there are gonna be no changes uh, from the current guidance that's been in place throughout the pandemic. So that means uh, international students still have flexibility regarding online courses, which is really great news. So students who are continuing in their program 
who have an active CVIS record, this is the majority of our current students here at UCF, may continue to take all online classes. Now there's a caveat, which we'll talk about. And the other group that is a little bit different is students who will have an initial I-20 with a spring 2022 start date. So um, this might be brand new students coming to UCF, or if you had spent some time away from UCF and received a new I-20 to return to resume full-time studies, and that I-20 is for spring, then if that's your situation, then you have to have at least one credit that's an in-person course. So what are in-person versus online courses at UCF? So the, this is called the course modality. So you can see this by logging into your My UCF, and when you're searching for classes, you'll actually click on like the course to see the details about the course, and you'll look at the instruction mode and also the class details to learn um, what the modality of the course is. So for immigration purposes, uh, we consider in-person courses to be face-to-face -face and blend flex courses. These are often coded with P. Um, mixed mode reduced seat time courses coded with M. And video streaming reduced seat time courses, which are RS code, and as well as active learning reduced seat time, which is RA. So those are all considered in-person courses. So meet the in-person requirement if you are in the in, if the situation applies to you that you need an in-person course. Online courses are video streaming, which is V and V1, as well as World Wide Web, which is W. So those courses are online courses for immigration purposes. So again, for, for spring 2022, if you are a continuing student, you're, you have an active CVIS record, this will be the majority of uh, international students at UCF. Uh, this is the chart of your enrollment requirements. So if you're in a bachelor's degree program, you need to have 12 credit hours of enrollment in the spring. Uh, you do not have an in-person requirement. So you are zero in-person in courses are required. Graduate students, you need nine credit hours with zero credits being in person. Uh, master's students who have completed all coursework and only have the thesis remaining and doctoral students who have um, passed candidacy are now in dissertation just require three credits of thesis or dissertation. Students in the intensive English program, the IEP, as well as GAA prep need to take five IEP courses. And then the Global Achievement Academy GAA program needs 14 credit hours. The Global Achievement Academy University Integration or UI program needs 12 credit hours in the spring. Now for those students who are either new students coming into UCF in the spring or who have an initial I-20 issued for spring semester who are returning to the US, you'll need to have an in-person course. So you still have the same total required credit hours needed. So bachelors, you still need 12 credit hours, but you can see that you do have an in-person requirement. So for example, a bachelor's degree student must, must take 12 credit hours and of those 12 credit hours, at least one credit hour must be on, uh, in person. Okay, so if you are currently outside of the US, you can continue to take full-time online courses from outside the US if online sections are available. And that's a really important caveat. So it may be necessary to return to campus to take the classes you need if there is not an online section. So UCF has really returned to um, close to normal levels of in-person courses. So it may not be possible. Most programs cannot accommodate a fully online schedule. So even though the immigration uh, guidance is that you don't have to have an in-person course, uh, in practicality, you, you may have in-person courses just because not all courses are gonna be offered online. Uh, but if, if they are <laughs> offered online and you're able to do that, you're, in, you're a current student with an active CVIS record, um, you can take online courses from outside of the US. Uh, also, if you are enrolling in an in-person course, it's important to note that you are expected to attend, attend your courses and adhere to the attendance policy that's listed in the syllabus. So if you're currently outside of the US and you're registering for an in-person course, you need to plan to, to be back on campus to attend that course. 
Uh, and so if you're currently outside of the US and you're enrolling full time, you can still keep an active CVIS record, even if your courses are online. So that's, that's great. Uh, but if you're not able to return to the US, what happens? So if you're able to get a fully online schedule and able to meet the minimum enrollment requirements, uh, you can continue taking those courses online from, from outside the US and keep an active CVIS record. Uh, but if you aren't able to enroll full time or maybe you know, only a few of the classes you need are, are offered online and you know, you're not able to get a full, full course load, um, you have to submit an exit form to UCF Global by January 10th. That's the first day of classes. And this, this will mean that your CVIS record will be terminated for authorized early withdrawal, which is uh, in immigration terms is basically a leave of absence. Um, it's not a negative CVIS termination, but it, it, it basically means that you're taking time off. Uh, so if, if this applies to you, and the CVIS is terminated for authorized early withdrawal, you are not gonna be required to enroll in any classes, but you could choose to continue enrolling if you would like to. Uh, if special note to our, our thesis and dissertation students, uh, if, if you've already entered your thesis or dissertation phase of your program, you may need to, to request a special leave of absence from the College of Graduate Studies um, because of the university policies that require continuous enrollment once you started your thesis or dissertation. So just be aware of that. And then students who do uh, have the authorized early withdrawal will, will most likely need a new initial I-20 to return to the United States in a future semester. So let's talk a little bit more about what does uh, termination for authorized early withdrawal mean? It sounds very scary, but it, what it really just means is a leave of absence. Um, you basically will, like I mentioned, will most likely need a new initial I-20 to return to the US whenever you're ready to resume in-person full-time coursework. And it's important to note that this does not impact your ability to take classes, to earn academic credit, or achieve your degree. So your immigration status, while it depends on your enrollment, you can still make academic progress regardless of your immigration status. So, so what does it mean to receive a new initial I-20 and how do you get it? So um, you can request a new initial I-20 for the summer, for example, the summer semester, if you're able to have a full-time course load in the summer or a later semester by completing the I-20 request for current students. We have a link on our website, which I, I'm sure the advisors will put in the chat. Uh, receiving a new initial I-20 does mean that you'd need to pay the CVIS I-901 fee again. Uh, the, currently that fee is $350. So there is a financial consideration. Also, it does reset the eligibility clock for curricular practical training and optional practical training. So basically you would have to be enrolled for a full academic year on the new CVIS record after you've arrived to the United States before you'd become eligible for CPT or OPT. Uh, and again, a full academic year is a fall and a spring semester. So students who are getting closer to graduation, who are really wanting to do an internship, this will be an important consideration when making your plans. And uh, for, in terms of the visa, you would only need a new F-1 visa if your visa has expired before you plan to return to the US. So if your current F-1 visa that's in your passport is still valid, you would just use that visa together with the new I-20 uh, that you received from UCF Global in order to return to the US. So again, this is just for students who are either not, do not wanna enroll in spring or who aren't able to take a full course load and need to remain outside of the United States or to depart. So that, those are the enrollment requirements for spring 2022. So as we look ahead, we, we anticipate that, that SEVP will release new guidance for the summer, and if not summer, we expect for the fall uh, 2022 semester, we are telling everyone to please plan for a full return to normal F1 and J1 enrollment requirements for both the summer and the fall 2022 semesters. Uh, so we'll, we'll go over what normal requirements are because it's been quite a while since we've been under normal rules. Uh, as always, UCF Global will send out uh, 
updates to students once any guidance is released. But right as of right now, we there's no new guidance. Um, but when there is, which we anticipate there will be, we will definitely let you know. So let's talk about what normal enrollment requirements are. And again, this is this is just for future consideration when you're planning for summer and fall 2022. Uh, so the same total required credit hours in the fall 2022 semester. So for example, bachelor's degree students need 12 credits, graduate students need nine credit hours, but the in-person requirement is different. So for bachelor students, if you have, your requirement is 12 credit hours total, of those 12 credit hours, at least nine credit hours must be in person. And you can only count three credit hours or, or one, one class towards the full-time enrollment requirement. So that means you could not take six credit hours online and six credit hours in person. You'd have to take nine credit hours in person and three credit hours um, online, up to, up to three credit hours online. So it, it is different than now. It's something that you'll have to really look at when registering for future terms and looking at the course modality to making sure that you have the in-person courses required. Again, not something you have to worry about right now, but just for, for planning purposes, we, we most likely, uh, if we had to make a, a bet, we most likely will be going to back to normal rules, we think in the fall semester. Again, nothing is certain yet. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Zach to talk to us about some travel considerations. Thank you, Christina, and, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Zach Saloum, Assistant Director here at International Student and Scholar Services, and we wanna thank you for, for attending this info session. As Christina mentioned, and our thank you for watching the recording for those of you who are watching it uh, after the fact. So as Christina mentioned, I mean, now is a, is a time of year where students are, are beginning to plan for travel as we enter into the holiday break and the holiday season. So we wanted to take some time to talk about travel considerations as things are recently changing. So for those of you who may have traveled in the past and feel like, you know, I know I need a travel signature, there are some new things to take into consideration. That's what we're gonna be sharing in the next few slides. So our main concern and our main priority is to make sure that when you do depart the United States, you have a smooth and successful return into the United States. So while we can't so much advise on travel restrictions in your home countries or traveling to other countries, our main concern and focus is making sure that you can successfully return to resume your studies for spring 2022. And so here on your screen is a checklist of documents that you will need to return into the United States. A valid passport, a valid visa, a valid form I-20 or DS 2019 with an appropriate travel signature that has been placed on the form within the preceding 12 months. And in a future side, we'll talk to you about how to obtain a travel signature if you do not have one or if the one you have has been issued uh, over 12 months from now or from the time that you're traveling. You will also need a negative COVID test, which has been administered within the preceding three days from the date of your entry into the country. And we'll go into more detail about that. And the next bullet point, which is new, you will also need to show proof of full COVID-19 vaccination. This is an announcement that was recently made by the, by the US government, and it will be effective in just three short days. So essentially anyone traveling for the Thanksgiving holiday over winter break and returning for the spring, you will need to show proof of full COVID vaccination before boarding a plane into the United States. We also recommend that students travel with course enrollment or course schedules, transcripts, anything that can establish your continued study at the university, although that's not required for entry into the United States. So let's talk a little bit in the next slide, please, uh, about how to get a travel signature, how to secure that vaccination, and, and you know, what kind of tests are acceptable. Um, but if you do not have a travel signature, or if you would like to confirm that the one you have received is still valid for travel, we encourage students to email 
intladvising at ucf.edu. It's kind of an abbreviation of the word international. So intladvising at ucf.edu and provide our team with the following information. Put your full name, your UCF ID number, the date of your last travel signature, if you've ever been issued a travel signature in the past, and if you haven't been issued a travel signature, you can certainly indicate that as well. And the date of your return to the United States. Now you can give us your whole travel itinerary if you'd like, but a key is when you plan to return, what date you plan to return to the United States. If you can provide us with that information by email, we'll happily take a look at your documentation, make sure that you're authorized to travel, and we will issue you that travel signature electronically and provide you with that I-20 via email so that you can print it out and travel with that travel signature. Over the next couple of slides, I'm going to be talking about uh, COVID vaccination requirements and COVID testing requirements. And I also, but I wanna preface it by providing you with reliable sources of, of information. There's a lot of information out there. Not everything you see on the internet is true and correct. So please be cautious as you are absorbing a lot of this rapidly changing information. And please direct yourself to reliable sources of information, such as the United States Center for Disease Control and Prevention. The website is on your screen right now, but you can certainly search cdc.gov for coronavirus travel information. We also encourage you to visit the US Department of State or your home country's, your home country government website for travel considerations and travel advisories. Also the airline website that use the airline, the website of the airline that you plan to use to enter the United States because you are ultimately going to have to provide that testing information and the vaccination information to the airline before you even board the airplane, um, that airline website will have the most up-to-date information as well. So don't necessarily look at Facebook, don't necessarily just Google uh, the information, go to reliable sources of information. And of course, the UCF Global Immigration Advising Team can provide you with uh, reliable sources of information. All right, so as I mentioned, effective November 8th, any FNJ non-immigrant student will be required to show proof of vaccination for entry into the United States. This is not a UCF requirement. It's not a Florida state requirement. The borders of the United States uh, are conditioning you to uh, receive that vaccine. Uh, and only in limited circumstances do exceptions apply. And I, I feel like there are a couple exemptions that might apply to students more than others. So if you have a fam if you yourself are under the age of 18, or if you have family traveling with you, maybe an F2 or J2 dependent child in this case, that's under the age of 18, they will not be required to show proof of vaccination. Also, if you or a traveling family member have a medical contraindication, meaning a, a, a condition, maybe you have a, a autoimmune disease or cancer or something that's preventing you from receiving the vaccination safely, a documentation of that condition and a doctor's note will suffice in place of vaccination. So if you just simply um, you know, your body can't take it or a doctor has advised against it because of a condition that you have, that's an acceptable exemption. And also if you're a citizen of a foreign country that just simply doesn't have readily available access to the vaccine, you may be eligible. Now, of course, students here in the United States currently who might be traveling out and back in, you have access to the vaccine here on campus. We encourage you to get that. Um, but if you are a citizen of a country and you've been outside the United States for some time and just simply haven't been able to get that vaccination, there is a short list of countries who qualify as limited vaccination availability. That list of countries is on the CDC website that we referenced earlier. Um, but if you have any questions about that, you can certainly get with an immigration advisor. We can provide you with that list. So everyone needs to be fully vaccinated in order to enter the United States. What does fully vaccinated mean exactly? 
uh, 14 days after an accepted single dose vaccine, that would be the Johnson and Johnson or Janssen vaccine, 14 days after the second dose of an accepted two dose series, or 14 days after the second dose of a mix and match a combination of accepted vaccines. So if you are only one vaccine shot through a two dose series, you are not considered fully vaccinated and you would not be um, considered fully vaccinated as required for entry into the United States. If you've received a vaccine very, very recently, right before your plane you know, departs, that's not considered fully vaccinated. You'll need to wait 14 days before entry into the United States. So again, this is a reiteration of the information on the CDC website, but if you have not yet received a vaccine, uh, I would encourage you to start researching, utilize the UCF Student Health Center or the resources available in your home country uh, to get this sorted out well in advance of your travel um, because that timing is sensitive. And I know we have a question in the chat. I think we can pause for questions at the end of this section. So we'll continue on. Um, what are the acceptable vaccines? I had a question from a student today who received one of the vaccines uh, that is actually not on this list. So I wanna talk specifically about what vaccines are going to be acceptable for entry into the United States. I made mention of the single dose vaccine from Johnson & Johnson or Janssen. There are also a two dose series. These are the acceptable two dose series vaccines. Those that were developed by Pfizer, BioNTech, Moderna, AstraZeneca, Covishield, Sinopharm, BIBP, or Sinovac. If you have received a vaccine developed by a pharmaceutical company that's not on this list, uh, and again, these, this list is uh, approved or authorized by the US FDA or World Health Organization. If you've received a vaccine that's not on this list, you are not going to be considered fully vaccinated for the purposes of entry into the United States. The main example that comes to mind is the Sputnik V vaccine developed by the Russian um, pharmaceutical you know, industry. Um, that is not on the list of acceptable vaccines. So for students who happen to have received that vaccination, you'll need to consider the other vaccinations, the, like the, you know, the other pharmaceutical companies and the other vaccinations uh, to establish full vaccination status. So that, that essentially means getting a new vaccine from one of these approved uh, vendors in order to enter the United States. How can you show proof of vaccination? What are the airports and airlines going to look for when you try to board that airport? What should you show to show prove that you've been vaccinated? Um, a QR code through a mobile app, um, that's a verifiable digital record. Uh, a paper record like a, a, a COVID vaccination card that has a, a signature and stamp from a medical provider. That's very common here if you've received a vaccination on campus or a non-verifiable digital record, for example, a photo of a vaccination card or a downloaded vaccination record um, from an official source, like from a doctor's agency or a government agency. So you'll need to provide, the primary sources are really going to be your, your QR code from a mobile app on your smartphone, a printout of your COVID vaccination card that you received from your provider who administered the vaccine, or a digital printout of a vaccination record from the vaccine provider. That's what they're going to look like when you board the airplane. So not only are you going to need to show proof of COVID vaccination, you are also going to need to show proof of a negative COVID test. So just because they are looking for proof of vaccination doesn't mean you don't also have to get that negative COVID test three days before you enter. So this has been in place for some months now. The COVID vaccination requirement is more new, but this has always been required. So the negative COVID test, it needs to be administered three days prior to entry, and the actual test results need to show whether it was an NA, NAAT test or an antigen test. Antigen tests are also acceptable. 
um, who is issuing the result, what's the name of the laboratory, what was the date that the specimen was collected, and that's important because they're going to look and see, has, was this administered three days prior to your travel? <clears throat> um, and then information that identifies you, your full name, uh, your date of birth, passport number, so multiple forms of identification, and then of course the test result. Uh, if you have recovered from COVID-19 within the last three months, that will also be acceptable. Uh, again, a positive test result from a documented recovery from COVID-19 will also be accepted in lieu of a negative test, but you'll also have to show proof of vaccination. So lots of, lots of healthcare documentation required for entry into the United States. All right, and then of course, just some considerations when you return, we wanna keep the student body health uh, and healthy and, and safe, and including all of our international students. So the CDC recommends that you get tested after you travel. You might've contracted COVID, even if you've received the vaccine, even if you had a negative COVID test three days prior to travel, you may have uh, contracted the, the, the illness during your travel. So we recommend, and the CDC recommends, that you get a viral test three to five days after you've returned to the United States. Now, conveniently, the University of Central Florida provides testing at our student health center upon appointment and scheduled appointment. So you're welcome to take that test three to five days after you travel. And then of course, monitor yourself just as you have been doing over the last few months. Isolate yourself if you develop symptoms, get tested three to five days after you travel uh, to keep yourself safe and to keep the university community safe. So I know we have some questions in the chat and some pre-submitted questions. I don't know if Christina, you wanna take the pre-submitted questions first or the chat questions first. Um, why don't we uh, go ahead? Cause we're just, are just talking about vaccination. Why don't we go ahead and take, I see a, a great question in the chat that says, I took the first dose of Pfizer in Brazil and the second one here when I arrived in August. So I have one dose registered on each card could, it, could that make it difficult for me to prove I'm fully vaccinated? That's a good question. Um, and, you know, I think that the University of Central Florida Student Health Center can provide you with uh, official documentation uh, that you need. I would travel, if I were in your situation, I would travel with both cards. Um, if they were administered, I think the second dose needs to be administered within a specific period. Um, but if you've received two doses of that two dose Pfizer vaccine, and it was over 14 days ago, you should be considered fully vaccinated. If I were you, I would just bring both cards showing that you've received both, both doses of the two dose series. It's a good question. And there are medical professionals at the Student Health Center here at UCF who can more fully address questions like that. But I, I think traveling with both documentations should be sufficient. Yeah, and that's a good point, Zach. I think the student health services can be a great resource just to give the COVID line a call even just to ask the question. They might be able to help you document it in one place or just recommend that you take both cards with you. All right, so let's get into some pre-submitted questions. All right, so I'm back home and cannot return for spring 2022. Can I still take classes? The answer is yes. You can, you can enroll full-time in online classes if the classes you need are offered in an online format. Uh, as long as you are enrolled full-time, you can maintain an active CVIS record. Uh, however, if, you're, if the courses you need are offered in person and you know you're not able to return uh, you, you really can't register for in-person in courses if you're not going to be here. So um, what we discussed earlier in the presentation about an authorized early withdrawal, you might have to consider that. Um, if you have any questions about that, you can always talk with the UCF Global Immigration Advisor. We'll be happy to, to discuss your situation with you. Will the, will the UCF Global Intensive English Program offer in-person classes? Uh, yes, uh, the UCF Global Intensive English Program classes are fully in person, so you actually need to be here uh, in, in the U.S. to take the Intensive English Program or IEP courses, so they, yes, they are in person. Are dissertation and directed research credits considered in person? This is a great question. Yes, they typically are. 
Um, both, both dissertation and directed research are typically coded as in-person. Um, I haven't seen otherwise. Uh, how can I get a travel signature? So Zach mentioned a little bit earlier, but we'll put it up here again. If you need a travel signature, please email us at intladvising at ucf.edu. Uh, you need to just make sure that you provide some information in that email to us. Uh, we need your full name, uh, your UCF ID number, the, the date of your last travel signature, which is on the most recent I-20 or, or, or DS 2019 that's been issued to you. Uh, it's on page two of the I-20 or page one of the DS 2019 and the date you expect to return to the US and we will be able to, to email you an I-20. Does my CVIS record status affect my ability to take classes? This was also a really great question. Uh, no, your CVIS record uh, does not affect your ability to enroll in classes or earn academic credit uh, or make progress in your degree or even earn a diploma. So that's completely separate than your CVIS record status. Um, so your academic status is independent of your CVIS record status, but your CVIS record depends on your academic status and enrollment. So to maintain your F1 or J1 status, you do have to be enrolled, but you can still enroll in courses even if, um, regardless of the status of your CVIS record. What are my options if I become ill or if I have a health condition? Uh, so if you have a documented illness or medical condition, and, and that condition restricts your ability to attend in-person courses or take classes at all, you can request what's called a reduced course load or RCL. And it's, it, the RCL is based on the recommendation of your medical doctor or licensed clinical psychologist. Uh, the RCL, uh, if it's approved, could enable you to take as few as zero classes or um, no in-person courses based on your doctor's recommendation. Uh, the, the requirements for this documentation are very specific. So please download the reduced course load form and there's instructions on, on the form of what that documentation uh, needs to contain and who is actually one of the types of providers that can issue that uh, to be accepted for the immigration purposes. So um, if that's your situation, you will want to download the reduced course load form. Those are typically due by the first week of classes. Um, we do review those throughout the semester if you need to withdraw, for example, uh, but just as at the beginning of the term when we have to verify enrollment, if you know that you, because of the medical condition, aren't going to be able to enroll full time, you need to make sure you get that in before the end of the first week of classes. All right, my passport expired. What should I do? Uh, so it's important to maintain a valid passport when you are in the United States. So uh, if, if your passport is going to expire or is already expired, you'll want to contact your country's nearest embassy to renew your passport. Each country and each, each consulate within, um, for, for each country, it has different processes. Some actually require you to go in person. Others, they allow you to do everything through mail or through like an online form. So you'll just wanna visit the, the website of your country's nearest embassy for the instructions on how to renew your passport. And don't forget to give UCF Global a copy of that once you've got your new document. Uh, we we keep, a, keep those on file. All right, is it possible to change the modality of my classes? So, so no, um, you cannot like request a, a change in the modality. However, if you there's another section of that, that same course that's offered in a different modality, you could always um, register or swap during the, ad, the swap period um, it, it to, to go into the other section of that course. All right, if I still have questions about my particular situation, who should I contact? Please contact us here at UCF Global. We, we're here for you. We want to be able to be helpful and make sure that you get answers to your questions. So uh, you can contact us a few different ways. Um, email is great, intladvising at ucf.edu. You can also give us a call. The number is listed there on the screen, 407-823-2337. 
Uh, also, we have walk-in hours. If you want to, to come in person to talk with an immigration advisor, those are every day in the morning from 10 to 11.45 and from 2 to 3.45 p.m. So we're here to help and uh, feel free to reach out if you have other questions. You can also check out our uh, coronavirus FAQ for international students at global.ucf.edu slash coronavirus. Um, I will just ask if there are any other questions that have come up in the chat, uh, or if you have a question, please feel free to put that in the chat now, and we'll try to answer that before we end for today. I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Um, oh, great question just came through. Um, are walk-ins offered via phone as well? Yes, you can also call in during, during walk-in hours as well. Uh, we know that not all of our students are here in the Orlando area, or even if you are, uh, you may just prefer to handle it through phone versus making a trip in. Uh, We're here to help however we can. So yes, feel free to give us a call. All right, well, I wanna thank you everyone again for attending today and for those uh, watching later uh, on YouTube. Thank you so much for joining us. If you have questions, please reach out. We're here for you and uh, we hope that you finish this semester strong and we look forward to another great spring semester uh, with you on campus. So uh, thank you everybody and go Knights, charge on. Thanks everyone. Thank you all.